My name is Jordan McSherry, and I want to tell you about the time I rode across America. There were 25 of us from different parts of the country. We came together for an incredible journey. We were going to cycle 3,800 miles across America. We were riding for those kids who can't. We were riding for boys who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We were riding for my brother Jet. Hi, I'm Jet McSherry, and I'm 12 years old and I'm from Pembroke, Massachusetts. To see him playing in the backyard with his sister and his dog, Isabel, you wouldn't know Jet McSherry is sick. I don't like it. Why not? It's hard to like walk and stuff in those. The 11 year old Pembroke, Massachusetts boy has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Duchenne affects about one in every 3,500 boys. For some, it's hereditary. For others, like Jet, it's a fluke of genetics. He was diagnosed when he was five. His mother, Christine, is a registered nurse and knew what lay ahead. The beginnings of the Jet Foundation started in 2001 when my son Jet was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I was devastated to find out that it was lethal, 100% fatal. And it all started very simply. He went to the doctors. He had his annual checkup when he was five years old. He had some difficulty getting up off the ground. And the physician suggested I go to Boston to have him evaluated just a little bit more. When I got to Boston, I saw another physician who thought he was perfectly fine but decided to do some blood tests anyways. Call me the next day to tell me his levels, CPK levels, were off the charts. Something that should be about 75 or 22,000. And I said that couldn't happen, that can't be so, because even in the worst heart attack situation, you would never have a CPK level of 22,000. Well, it turns out that you can if every muscle in your body is dying and has been since the day that you were born. The public awareness of it is, I think, showing gains of recent, and it actually is remarkably common. One in 3,500 live-born males is not a rare disorder. I would say in terms of people's awareness of it, I think people get the idea of what maybe a kid on the telethon looks like who's in a wheelchair, but to really know what it is to live and to love someone who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, I would say, in general, the public has no idea. Living with somebody with Duchenne is a lot different than seeing it from the outside. You see the, you see the real boy. You see everything about him while everybody else just sees a picture. There was a gentleman named Duchenne, and he was the first, he's credited to be the first to describe two boys that have this condition. And it was actually given by a person named Sir William Gowers, who gave him the name, and this dates back into the 1850s. Uh, there actually were two people that described Duchenne muscular dystrophy before Duchenne, and they don't seem to get the credit, but they definitely have, this dis disorder has been described over 150 years ago. Uh, I told the story of uh, the Jet Foundation, as Christine McSherry told me, and I shared that with uh, young people in our group, and they immediately made the connection between uh, boys that can't ride and the, uh, the boys that could ride, or the young adults that could ride. And from there, their imaginations ran wild, and they were able to put together what we have today. We're going for a jet ride across the country. We're leaving with 26 young adults, and we're going to come back with a different group of 26 young adults who are going to be more mature, who are going to love life, and cannot wait to do this again.
I think it was very heartwarming at the beginning. I was with them when they dipped their back tires in uh, the beach at Seaside, Oregon. That was very exciting for us. Finally tonight, dozens of teenage bicyclists are pedaling their way across the country to raise a million dollars for charity. Now, the group is from Boston, but it's starting its ride from Seaside. They'll bike all the way to Massachusetts to raise money for the Jet Foundation. That foundation raises awareness and funds for treating Duchenne muscular dystrophy. DMD is a fatal disease that affects boys and young men. I think that it's pretty cool that I get to have the chance to bike across the country because if you think about it, Jet can't do that, so. And I don't really, I really don't know anybody that has any kid that can say that they bike, that they've ridden their bike across America. So I find that pretty neat. My friends honestly didn't believe me until they saw me packing my bags and they saw my airplane ticket, and um, they thought I was insane. And then I told, I actually knew at the beginning of my junior year about this trip. So I told like, I told some of my teachers. I probably told like my history teacher and like my great books teacher. And from there, like I swear the whole faculty found out and everywhere I went, I was just known as the girl who's riding her bike past me. Uh, Jordan told me about this ride and I decided that I would try it. And then she told me that it was like something that no one else really gets the chance to do. I decided to do it. Um, after pedaling 80, 85 miles, 100 miles, everything hurts. Like, don't let anybody ever tell you nothing. Like, you get used to it. You don't get used to it. Um, everything hurts. And, pains and aches come and go, and it just all, something always hurts. What keeps me going on like a hard day, like today, would probably be Jet. Just think about like how he has to struggle through all this and how we can help him by like feeling what he feels, so yeah. My friend Caroline, she did that when she was biking one day. She's like, oh, I sobbed the entire morning. And I was like, you did? She's like, yeah, I couldn't stop thinking about Jet and all the stuff he has to go through. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, that's OK. So I read this and decided that this is really what we should share for tonight, our shared story. So Pamela, she writes, I would like to take thank this, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your beautiful and informative website. We found out 12 days ago that my almost five-year-old grandson, born on September 12th, has Duchenne. I'm at a loss for words to describe the pain we felt for this tiny boy. His parents have taken him to numerous doctors throughout his life and gotten no definitive diagnosis until now. We are fortunate that we're near Atlanta and therefore Emory Hospital and some of the best specialists for MD in the country, but we're still scared. We don't know what Danny is going to have to face during his life. I can't imagine what that would be like. How helpless they must feel. I knew exactly what Duchenne muscular dystrophy was, and uh, when we found out that it was definitely Duchenne, we were devastated by it. Um, when the doctor looked me in the eye and told me what Wyatt had, there's just this profound sadness that is hard to describe. There was anger, there was denial. Um, I think the most difficult part is the fact that these boys were once riding a bike, they were once playing baseball, they were once playing soccer, 
and now they have to ask their parents why they can no longer do that. Slowly but surely, usually from the ages five and up, everything is stripped away. One of the most challenging things for me is to watch um, my son eat pepperoni pizza. It's his favorite. And I don't know how someday I'm going to tell him that he can no longer eat it because I'm concerned that he'll choke. Again, his, his muscles and his esophagus eventually will weaken to a point where he may not be able to enjoy those things. I love yes. you. Oh my, it's my broke. These are like carnivores. Here, let me, let me fix that up a little. There we go. It's all about the food and the riding. We discourage a lot of physical movement because when you have a lot of physical movement, you're tearing up the muscles faster. So in order to prolong their life and prolong their respiratory and cardiac status, um, kids are asked to slow down just a little bit and, and we try to minimize the physical activity that they have. get tired of banging on the drums downstairs? No. I get like exhausted sometimes playing on the drums, but I can't really play the drums, so I just bang around until you yell at me to get off of them. But that's just me. And then once we're in the park, please take the time to observe the wildlife. Have a good time. It's not a rush. We have 50 miles. There's a climb after we come out of uh, Old Faithful. But other than that, it's pretty easy riding for us. So take your time. You don't need to rush. We have all day. I remember seeing amazing sights like Yellowstone and Mount Rushmore. At the same time, learning to adjust to the incredible heat and pain we felt all the time. Today's 46-mile ride starts right after breakfast. In small groups, they quietly glide over mountain rivers, up the challenging hills, and past towering rock walls. 46 miles in one morning is a tiny part of a long trip. Over a thousand miles. Mm -hmm. And three weeks. This group just came out of Yellowstone. They crossed the spine of the Rockies, and they're not even halfway to their destination yet. Hey guys, the official mileage is 1,013 miles. You ever yeah. thought you'd ride 1,000 miles on your bike? How many vibrators? 1,000 miles. 1, miles. <laughs> yeah! But we've done, we have done one, over 1,000. 1,013 is the official mileage. Whatever you say, it doesn't matter. 1,013. The first 1,000 miles were tough, but they were busy and they went by really fast. We had more than 2,000 miles to go, and there was no turning back. Wyatt knows that he has muscular dystrophy. He does not know that it is Duchenne. Uh, he's 10 years old. Kids at 10 years old today are computer savvy. I'm afraid that he's way too smart and will get right on the computer and find out. My son is on Duflazacort, which is a European approved version of prednisone, which uh, steroids are really the only approved medication for children with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We do have and we advocate that the children who have Duchenne start steroid treatment as early as possible. It does for some reason, and, and scientists aren't really sure yet why, but it does seem to delay some of the inevitable disabilities that the kids incur. Wyatt has much more strength with the deflazacort, but there are many, many side effects um, from the deflazacort. There are supportive things we can do. We certainly want to make sure if he needs heart medicines, those are there for him. 
breathing assisted devices, cough assist devices, but in terms of any other medicine, there's nothing other than corticosteroids. See you back here. We have uh, Washington, and we go to Jefferson, and Roosevelt, and to finish it off. We have Lincoln. In the battle against a deadly disease, some kids are biking across the country. They're raising money for the research for a cure for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD. More than 25 cyclists are riding 3,800 miles from Oregon to Massachusetts. They stayed at the Howard Johnson in Rapid City today and will hit the road to Interior tomorrow. The jet ride is named after Jet McSherry, a child diagnosed with a DMD. The teens, including Jet's sister, say that they ride for those who can't. I decided to do it because I thought it'd be a great opportunity and to help Jet. It's been amazing and hard and excruciating, but it's been worth it. What's the toughest part about riding to the Black Hills? Uh, the heat. Yeah, the heat probably. It's pretty miserable riding because we have long days. We've got 75 to 100 mile days in this heat. And it's just horrible. I heard that it was 110 in the shade. So, <laughs> it was pretty hot. <laughs> You're right, There's nothing. I've seen a dead snake and about 200 cars. flies. Oh, and dead rabbits. Like two dead rabbits that just and dead sparrows. I don't feel good. You have to eat. Eat some bread. Anything. You have to eat something. You're gonna die. Well, not physically <laughs> die. Hot blasty headwind like you opened up a stove and just stood in front of the stove. Except do that for I think maybe 40 miles, 44 miles on 130 degree day, so it gets very tiring very fast. And so that day we actually got bust in because of that heat. Jet played just about every sport, from ski racing to soccer, baseball, swimming, golf. He loved every sport. the dreams of a boy of wanting to be an athlete, a professional athlete. It's a very prominent theme in this country. A lot of, um, of these boys are the biggest sports fans you'll ever imagine. They can't necessarily participate in the sports, but they want to be as close to it as they can. Well, there are many things I can't do, which I um, can't play sports, um, can't do anything most things normal 16 year olds can do. Uh, when I see my friends doing sports and dates, um, sometimes I, f I feel ha happy for them. But most of the time I'm either jealous or I remind me of the th that I really can't do those things. But also as a father, you saw uh, hopes, uh, dreams um, dashed quite quickly. Um, simple things as to um, 
you know, grow up throwing the baseball with your son or, uh, you know, taking him to, you know, football or baseball games. You, you kind of see a lot of those things um, kind of disappearing before your eyes um, when you hear about a diagnosis like this and the likelihood of his longevity and things such as that. To drive by a baseball field and see kids playing and you wonder what would he be like if he could walk? What would this be like? What would his life be like? And you can't dwell on it, but it's, uh, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. of the journey probably had to be when they ran into other families who had children with Duchenne. And that probably doesn't sound great, but the fact of the matter is is that it brought it home to them and it matured them to become representatives of the charity that they were representing. And I think that was very important. So each time they ran into another family, they became more confident in their speech, they became more confident in what they were doing, and they became more confident in themselves. So they can, uh, can they, they can tell early on whether they have the gene or not. Well, or if it's already like in your, basically like in your family, yeah. they just did like a CK test. Oh, okay. And they say is normal, so okay. they just said basically oh, okay. he's fine. How far did you travel to come here? Well, actually, we're from Brighton, so we're only about an hour and 15 minutes away. We just found out about it about a, a week ago, and so we're like, oh my gosh, and so this is just... We've just been excited. We, we met a couple other families. When we were in Lapeer, Michigan, um, a bunch of families who had kids with Duchenne showed up, and we got to play in a playground with them for about two hours. We got to have dinner with them and their siblings, and I met a bunch of little girls who were about my, who were about around the same age that I was when Jet was diagnosed, and they were really cute, and they, they kind of expressed the same kind of concerns that I did when I was eight years old. Well, I'm Jordan. This I'm is Caroline. This is Megan. This is Danielle. That's Brandon. And that's Phoebe. Okay. Okay. Alex. Alex. He was nine years old. He was nine. I think he was a, he was a, as advanced as Jeff. Jeff's not in a wheelchair though. Or he yeah. was in a, he was walking though. Yeah, but, yeah, Jeff's but it was like wheelchair at all. Yeah, so you could tell that it was like it's kicking in. Yeah. And uh, so, and some of the boys, remember the boys who were pushing on the swings? Yeah. Zach and Ty mm -hmm. were pushing on the little tire swing and then they couldn't hold on. Because they were strong enough to hold on. They were yeah. only three and four. Jonathan, well, I couldn't he had trouble I holding on. Do with their <laughs> oh, <that. laughs> we just went in the So then, then yeah. Zach or Ty fell down when, when we had to fell, pick him up. And um, get tired a lot. Jonathan, Jonathan couldn't hold on for that long. I'd have to keep reminding him, you have to hold on tight, Jonathan, or else you're going to fall. Yeah. And then one time he fell because he just couldn't hold on. They get tired out faster. <laughs> The boys who were there, they were between boys who you couldn't tell who Duchenne and boys who were in wheelchairs. And the kids on the trip, the, um, especially the boys, I was really surprised that the boys were really good with the kids. They followed them around, they talked to them, they played games with them, they pushed them on the swing. They are all really, just really good with the boys. The younger ones were running around having fun, it didn't look like they were struggling with anything because they haven't really been into the... Stay, they haven't gotten into the more severe stages. It, it was tough to see all of them because it, it really shows like what it does to them because you saw the younger ones who were like five and four and I think one was six but they were all like they could run around still and then there was a few that were older and they one of them had a wheelchair with them because he couldn't walk a lot so um, it was really hard to see how much it hurts them and how lucky some of them are to have like support and stuff. And it's hard to see the ones that don't have a lot of support. One of the first things that the doctor noticed when they asked the boys to get up to the floor or to run is how big the back of their calves are and uh, or how, you know, how tight they are. And that's like the first thing that says, okay, you have to go get tested. 
for this, so that's what the doctors will notice, and that's like I can. That's what I've noticed, and they walk on their toes. Yeah, they can't walk on their heels. Walking, and that's really that's bad for them to really walk bad. on their toes. Yeah. So my mom always makes jet, always reminds them, no walking on your toes. You have to walk on your walk on your heels. Heel, heel toe, heel toe. Heel, toe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, she calls it the robot walk. Yeah. Yesterday when we were playing with the kids, it kind of brought everything to life, and it, like we all realized as a group why we were riding across America for Duchenne and. It was a pretty amazing experience just to like be with kids who had DMD and go- see what they're going through and share their experiences and stuff. Boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy tend to present to us when they're young, toddler ages, where they're either late walking or falling a lot, tiptoe walking, similar to what a lot of these boys on that playground were doing. And they look pretty vigorous and maybe a little bit clumsy and they may fall and get up and that's what you expect toddlers to do. But as they get to maybe seven, eight, nine, ten, you, it's pretty clear they're not running like other kids. They can't jump. Climbing is extremely difficult. And usually by about 12, 11, 12, the natural history of Duchenne is wheelchair dependence, where the falling becomes so frequent and being able to get themselves back up becomes so difficult that a lot of these boys are much safer, actually, when they actually do become dependent upon their wheels and their scooters. I think the low points for me of the journey had to be losing my daughter for nine weeks. It had to be the separation in her anger towards me for having the child with Duchenne that made her do this. I think her own family responsibility came in the way between us as mother and daughter uh, as we both struggled to be um, the pioneer, let's say, to try to help Jet. Uh, Obviously the love for Jet from both of us is huge and I think that we both struggled throughout the nine weeks of who was doing what and who was doing it better. During the Jet ride I was angry at my mother for sending me on the trip and I felt like she left me there without a lot of support and um, I was angry but I, I was but I was really very busy and really tired and I didn't think about it a lot but when somebody brought her name up I would get angry at her and I didn't call her for like a month <laughs> I didn't want to talk to her <laughs> I really just didn't want to talk to her I didn't want to talk to anybody if I had to make some common themes about how it affects a family, I've been awed with how devastating news of this diagnosis can be for an entire family, an entire community, grandparents, aunts and uncles. I've seen situations where families have broken up because of this diagnosis. Uh, some in some instances, certain ethnicities, when I mention the idea that it's an X-linked recessive disorder that comes by way of mom's side of the genes, I have seen some families break up um, where a father who may not be as supportive as you'd wish wants to blame someone and blames mom. I've seen situations where grandparents went into fluid clinical depression over their grandchild, grandson having this diagnosis. I've seen situations where siblings um, became so upset and distraught that they, many of them needed counseling and in some cases you know, medical therapy. When we discovered that Wyatt had Duchenne, I also realized that my idea of what a family should have happen, which is to come together, was actually the opposite and my family actually was torn apart. Well, the impact on the family when uh, you have a child with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, in some sense, everyone in the family grows up probably a little quicker than um, you'd really want them to. I know that Nick's sister, Alex, has probably grown decades upon uh, what she really um, should have been. Um, first of all, when you learn out that you have a sibling that has a devastating disease, um, things like uh, the lifestyle and longevity, those are things that young children really shouldn't have to know about at that age, and she's had to learn about that at an early age. But even just the, the day-to-day things where um, 
I know in our house, you have to go get Nick a glass of milk, so someone has to help us out, um, take Nick's dishes and put them in the dishwasher, or go, go get him a straw so that he can actually drink out of the, the cup himself. Um, we have to cut up his meat for him. Um, and, and then the kids all take turns doing that. So these are things that, you know, you're looking at, you know, 13 to 16 year old children that are having to, to do adult-like things. So it, it does have an impact. You know, it has been hard. I am a single parent and um, I, divorced and part of the reason obviously our marriage probably fell apart was because of some of this. There were other issues before that but I think if you don't have a strong marriage going into something like this it can't survive and we just did, it wasn't strong enough and it we're just the kids are better off now with us being in, in separate places. I think I've actually handled this better emotionally by myself. So I'm a mother of a child who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. If I ever knew that this was going to be the path that my life would take, would I take it again? I'm not really sure. Some days, yes, because I've met some amazing, wonderful, generous people. And some days, no, because it has to be one of the hardest roads that there is to go on. have a parade into town. There's some balloon thingy we have to do, or ride through or something. Um, it's just that when we're riding, it's going to be really exciting to see everybody. Please ignore everybody. Just ride your bike, keep your eyes on the road. Otherwise, you'll have a nice, big, fantastic crash, which in itself could be entertaining. There were times along the trip when people came out to greet us, and I thought, whoa, they really care. They really get it after all. There we go. Everybody, smile big. <laughs> and there were other times, like when we were at the Mall of America, when I felt that nobody cared, nobody got it, and things would never change. Uh, why are you drinking a smoothie when you can learn about our ride across the country? The Mall of America, I sort of expected that much, you know? I guess that I've, I haven't seen as much support for the Douche community as for so many other charities. And I looked between, I don't know who they were, but some MTV rappers or something were on the other side of the mall. And I remember going over there and looking down at them and there were so many people signed up. I didn't even know who they were. They were all lined up to get autographs. And then, I, and then all the girls sitting at the booth waiting for somebody and kids were yelling at them, and these kids were just biked across, like halfway across the country to be here, and nobody even, nobody was even nice to them, which was the sad part. People were harassing them, people were talking down to these kids, and I was, I was it was upsetting. Okay, first of all, I have to survey a few people. Caroline, yes. are you staying or are you going? Staying. Stay. 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 Quiet. I'm staying. I was so excited that Caroline was staying. I had to beg her to come in the first place. I never thought she'd stay the whole time. When I first started the trip, I was only supposed to do the first two weeks. I think I've surprised a few people. Um, Arlen, I know, because he didn't think I'd make it, and my mom my dad, my parents, um, I don't know, just people that. Let's see, Caroline is staying.
arranged for a fundraiser in our hometown. We the um, well, we're here for my fundraiser, and there's a lot more people here than we expected, so we had to set up some extra tables. But um, everyone's here for a lasagna dinner, and then we're gonna do a little presentation, so hopefully it's worth the turnout. <laughs> Um, Jillian Yorg's fundraiser in Hudson, Wisconsin, which is where she lives, that was really nerve-wracking for me. That was really scary because I had to speak in front of a load of people who I had no idea who they were. Jen is almost 12 years old, 12 in October, on October 12th. He, um, <laughs> he is really great. He's the best kind of little, he's like every other boy except he cannot he can't walk as far as every other boy. He cannot ride a bike. So doing this is really, for all these kids to be doing this, well, he can't, it's kind of amazing for him because he can't do any of, he can't ride a bike. So riding across the country is un absolutely, completely out of the question. I was sitting there with these, with some people, um, a boy and his mother, and the boy was about 17, and the, his mom, and his mom was really odd. And she was really, really off, and she just, didn't talk to us much, she didn't say much. She, her son looked at his hands the entire time. He didn't say anything. We thought, me and Jillian were just like, oh, what's with these people, why are they here? And then I went up and I spoke in front of all those people and I was so nervous and I was so terrified. And I, got, I sat back down and then as she was leaving, she told me that she had two sons with Duchenne who died so many years ago. I don't know how many years ago, but she had two sons and she had um, driven all this way just to see us because she heard about us and she didn't know who we were, she didn't know if we were real or not, but she had driven all that way just to hear a little bit about us and what they were doing for Duchenne. And it was, it really hit me that it was just so amazing. I also remember thinking that my brother will never be able to experience these things, certainly not in the way that I did. Um, a typical day is usually involves me getting up right in the morning. My mom has to get me up, get me changed, get me ready. Then I have to use a special lifting device to get me into my wheelchair. And I go through many phases of f trying to fix my pants and shirt. And then I have to go brush my teeth and usually take rec have breakfast when my mom feeds me. Then I go to school. I have a full-time aide, so that helps. When I first met Nick Larkin at the Jet Ride reunion, it was, it was hard for me at first to even be in the same room with him because he had the same disorder as my brother did. And I never wanted to see my brother in that much pain. I never wanted to see him like that. But after you get past um, what somebody looks like or so, what their disorder is, you see they're just like everybody else and he has a personality. And he has, he's funny and he has a life and he has friends. You just have to look past what people look like. I am used, now using a breathing device. So that's another thing added that we have to do. And then in the middle of the night, I need to be re repositioned a couple of times. So it's pretty much a 24 hour job for my mom having to deal with all this. Watching every day your child lose his ability and asking you questions along the way about why he can't throw the ball like he used to, why last year he could get out of the swimming pool and this year he can't. Mom, it's okay if you put my bivalve nightcast on at night because I don't want to end up with my feet, you know, the way that you've shown me that they could go. Stretching him every night, every morning before he goes to bed. Three hours in the morning, three hours at night of care. Is probably the most difficult job anybody could ask for.
the natural progression beyond that is really continuing de decline of muscle function where the muscle cells are being replaced by scar tissue and the muscle bulk is just continuing to relentlessly degenerate. And when you get into the late end stages of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which may be in the late teens, 20s, really you're dealing where the muscle tissue is no longer muscle. It really is scar tissue. So the abilities to breathe, the heart being a muscle also can be compromised. And those would be the two major reasons why they ultimately will succumb, whether it's heart failure or it's a pneumonia. Those are things that generally these boys, young men, will die by their mid-20s. Um, I hope that my son had would never come to me with some of the questions that um, he wanted. And the one big question that I knew eventually he was going to ask is really what was down the line for him. I found out about the full extent of my disease a couple of years ago when my mom had been looking up a different disease in the uh, medical dictionary. And I, I remember I had asked to look at it and my mom hesitated. He said to me, Mom, is muscular dystrophy in there? And I hesitated because the thought that went through my head is like, God, I don't want him to read this. This is so horrible. It's there in black and white. There's no way he's not going to see this. Um, and when I hesitated, he said to me, Mom, why won't you let me see it? She was afraid that, that I should, if I saw it, that I might get upset, but that I, I might find I'll probably find it on my own. So my mom let me read it. Um, everything else, I know most of it except for the age expectancy. So I. Being, I didn't believe it, so I asked mom, "This is it for me?" And she said, "Yeah, it is." I said, so I mean, I was pretty upset. So I was up crying for a couple hours. My mom had to sleep on the floor in my room for a couple nights because I just couldn't deal with it. But I finally realized that I can't stop it. He read it and uh, he fell apart. And he, the first question he said is, "Oh my God, do my friends know?" And I said, honey, I, I don't know what your friend's parents have talked, to, talked with them about. I said, um, I, I'm not sure. And so he went through this whole range of emotions for like a half an hour. He actually had to sleep on the floor of his room for a couple nights until he could actually um, deal with it. But you know, the funny thing was about six months later, he said to me, mom, um, you know that thing that we read together? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know what? I'm okay with that. He said, um, I think that God, maybe God has a special place for me. And I said, yeah, I think you're right, honey. Senses, you're going down because it's green here and no trees here. So it's probably got trees up here on top. You thought yesterday was miserable. Whoa, wait for today. I, DTH, which stands for Brandon Terrence Hall, will give everything to Aaron David Phoebe, which is me. When I die, today, because I freeze on my back and I tip over. Yes. Put that back. I'm really looking forward to going home. Um, I miss my house so much. I miss my bed. 
I miss being able to like go to like the refrigerator and get whatever I want out of it. <laughs> and um, my computer. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna. I'm going to our house, house for my house for the weekend. We're getting and breakfast, lunch, and dinner in, in bed. bed. And we are going to make. I'm gonna make Facebook. She's gonna make MySpace. I'm gonna make MySpace. And we're gonna print out Watch, all um, of Sex and the City, Grey's Anatomy, Grey's Anatomy. And we're going to print out all the pictures. I did all the pictures from the trip. Trouble again. We're like, no, <laughs> it's just the, it's just them coming to get us. So it's good. Yep. <laughs> it's funny. I look forward to finally getting in, getting home, seeing everybody, all my friends, and have one day off and then get to go to school. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be nice to go home and like rest and everything, but it's gonna be kind of sad because I'm gonna miss everything. What did you do during your summer vacation? Read a book? Go to the beach? Ride your bike? Across the country? That's exactly what a determined group of teens did to raise money and awareness for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We have a group of uh, 26 shoes that will be crossing, that have just crossed 3,800 miles. So months after the jet ride, my reflections on the ride itself are mostly on Jordan. Jordan as, a, as it enriched her life and her experience as she came away with many life experiences. Uh, best friends were made. Um, she put herself physically through things that she never thought she could accomplish, that I didn't even think she could accomplish. And she really proved to herself and to her friends, her community, that she could get this thing done. And she did it. The bike trip changed me in a way that a lot of people can't understand. It really matured me a lot. I never expected that I would like it as much as I did. All the complaining that I did, 
and all the whining and all the saying how much I didn't want to be here was just, it's just, now it just seems ridiculous. The bike trip hasn't changed the relationship with my brother that much, really. He's still my brother. He still loves me just as much as he did before the bike trip. And I think that he still loves me even if I hadn't done the bike trip. He wouldn't have, it wouldn't have made such big of a difference to him. The jet ride was a huge success in creating a catalyst for us to have a platform in which we could then say we needed care for our boys. I was a huge advocate of trying to create a place where boys could go and it would be a safe haven, a place where boys could go and they would get the care that they needed. I felt very discouraged time after time going into hospitals, looking for the care that I wanted for my son and leaving the door the same way as I came without anything. So the jet ride was able to provide a voice for me to enter into Mass General Hospital and offer them something that nobody else had, and that was the creation of a multidisciplinary clinic, along with a wonderful physician and a researcher. So I wonder if I would ever do the jet ride again. And it's a really open-ended question. It's a, it's a difficult one that I think about often. I think I would do it again, but I would do it differently. I think knowing the obstacles that the kids endured, the obstacles that I came across, um, just in our planning, we would just we would do it differently. But yeah, we would do it again. We would cross the country again. We would spread the word about Duchenne. We would ride bikes for kids that couldn't ride, and we would allow these kids to live a life that they couldn't normally live. Both the riders and our boys with Duchenne. And all the, all the times that we said, oh, we're never gonna do this again, and now all we can think about is doing it again. And all we can think about is everybody there. And it's just, it just really matured me, and it made me think about the rest of my life and the future, and not so much in the present and what's going on right now. I can't help but wonder sometimes what my brother would be like if he didn't have muscular dystrophy. What does the road ahead look like? I don't know. No one can know the future. I do know that I have hope. Today counts. It's still better than nothing. It's all great. snack food on it. Not the table over. Gianna! Now which one are my eyes under? <laughs> <laughs>